Hello X11 fans, and today might be a sad day for you if you use GNOME as there's the first merge request that will start the process of removing support for X11 from GNOME. We also have the release of Ubuntu 23.10, which is a fantastic release. And we have good news from Mastodon, which it turns out is way more popular than everyone thought. Plus, we have updates to Plasma 6, to GNOME applications, and a new way to run Windows software on Linux that's coming. And we also have this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Thunderbird. Most of you probably know about it, but for those who don't, it's an all-in-one suite that handles email, calendar, contacts, tasks, RSS feeds, and chats. Thunderbird recently received a giant update with a full redesign of the app that makes it easier than ever to set up your accounts and to be productive. The interface is very customizable with multiple choices for interface density, view modes, panels, and the ability to place any button you need in the top bar. After this update, Thunderbird is now my email and calendar client of choice. Also, it's fully open source, it's free of charge, and it's available for any Linux distribution, Windows, and Mac OS. So whether you used Thunderbird in the past or not, click the link in the description below and give the new release a try. You will not regret it. A new merge request was opened in the GNOME project, proposing to end X11 support in the desktop environment, moving to a Wayland-only model. Gnome already embraces Wayland and the more modern Wayland portals and Flatpak stack, but X11 support is still there for now, for those who prefer it, but this might not last for long. The merge request would only be the first step, removing the ability to start an X11 session from the login manager by just removing the desktop file associated with it. The argument is that Gnome has been defaulting to Wayland since 2016, although distros shipping GNOME might not have done so themselves. And also, X11 is basically abandonware at this point. There's just a few security fixes, but no new features are being planned or being worked on. This change in GNOME would be easily reverted for now, as you could just manually add that X11 session file. But for the next cycle, it is proposed to completely remove all the X11 session code from GNOME, which would make it impossible to start an X11 session entirely unless someone creates a patched version. This is not unexpected, as Fedora 40 already had a proposal to drop X11 regardless of GNOME's support, and Plasma 6 is also going all in on Wayland, making it their default option as well. Of course, it's just a merge request for now, it still has to be accepted, and there is obviously some debate pointing out a few remaining bugs in the Wayland session and some missing features, notably accessibility-related ones. Obviously, this will not go down smoothly, as people who do not like Wayland or for whom Wayland doesn't really work just yet will fight tooth and nail to prevent this from happening, even if it's just a removal of one session file that's easily reverted. But it's more of a signal that GNOME sends to app developers and to desktop developers as well that, yes, X11 is dead and Wayland is the only way forward that we have. Ubuntu 23.10 was released this week, and then quickly pulled, preventing users from downloading it. The reason is that some ill-intentioned idiots decided to use their access to translations in various languages to slip some hateful stuff in the installer of the distro. So this also affects all flavors that use the new Ubuntu installer. There was apparently a lot of pretty provocative political stuff added in relative to the current events in Ukraine and Israel, which obviously had nothing to do with the Ubuntu installer, but still slipped unnoticed. Still, ISOs might already be out again without the offending data, and it's a wonderful release, all things considered. I have a dedicated video about it, you can check it out from the link in the description, but here is a small recap of what changed. First, there's a new tiling extension added that supports quarter tiling and using half of the height of the display to tile a window. There's a brand new app store that supports snaps and Debian packages, and it's much, much faster and better looking than the horrible, outdated fork of GNOME software Ubuntu used previously. There's a new firmware update tool, the default install method will now ship less applications out of the box, although the full install is also available, and you can use an experimental encryption feature using the TPM chip of your computer 
if it has one. Although it has a lot of restrictions and it can't be used with dual boots or with NVIDIA proprietary drivers. There are also all the features of GNOME 45, like the new workspaces indicator, improvements to background apps, the new keyboard backlight indicator in the quick settings, the new split header bar design, better Nautilus search, improved settings, and a lot more. It is a really, really good release for Ubuntu users. Of course, it's not an LTS, so it's only going to get nine months of support. And it's too bad that this release was marred by some imbecile who thought that an installer for Linux distro was the right platform to spew their hate. Now, it looks like Mastodon is actually a lot more popular than everyone thought. They've been undercounting their users by an enormous margin, since it turns out Mastodon has 400,000 more monthly active users than previously thought, and 2.3 million more registered users, over 727 servers that were previously uncounted. The statistics on joinmastodon.org were incorrect, and so the actual total is 1.8 million monthly active users, and 10,000 active servers, which represents an increase of 5% for month over month users and 12% in terms of the number of servers. So Mastodon is not only an alternative to proprietary social networks, it's also a relatively fast growing one, especially compared to stuff like Threads from Facebook that keeps losing users month after month, or Twitter, sorry, I'm never calling that thing X, that is slowly declining. Although, let's be fair, Twitter is still the largest platform in its category, with more than 245 million daily active users. I actually deactivated my Twitter account this week, because I hadn't been posting anything for probably a year or so, and I had no plans of going back to it as long as it continues on its absolutely horrendous trajectory. Now, it looks like Plasma 6 still has some features we were not expecting. First, in terms of accessibility, it will join the likes of Elementary OS by providing color filters for the whole screen for people with color blindness, including various settings to accommodate the differences in color perception. Kate, KWrite, and any other text editing app using the K Text Editor module will now support speech to text and smooth scrolling is finally making an appearance in Qt Quick based software. Panel launcher icons will now be disabled by default when you have a task manager, since pinning apps to the task manager does the same thing in a less confusing way. This behavior is configurable, of course, since it's KDE. And finally, you will also gain the ability to flip the display under the Wayland session. As per GNOME, Cartridges, the games library app, now supports searching for games straight from the desktop, just like you would search for a file or an app. There's a new app called Dosage that lets you track your medication with notifications, inventory tracking, and various frequencies you can set. Wildcard, the regex creation app, now has a references panel to quickly test common patterns. And Fretboard, the guitar chords reference app, now supports left and right-handed guitar types and gained a bunch of translations. It is really cool to see that Plasma 6 still has some stuff that we haven't seen or talked about yet, especially accessibility-related stuff for colorblindness, because this seems to be something that really affects a lot of people. Now, if you know and use the Bottles app to run various Windows games or programs on Linux, you might be happy to learn there's an even more advanced project in the works called Bottles Next. It's not an update or an evolution of the current Bottles app, it's a complete new thing. It's written in Go instead of Python, and it will also be available to macOS users, not just for us Linux users. The goal is to simplify the use compared to Bottles, with no individual bottle management. Apps will still be isolated in their own prefixes and environment, and still get all the settings you might want for DXVK, FSR, and various variables, but all apps will be collected in a single view to be more intuitive to use, and the users won't have to manage the bottles themselves. A more controversial change is the move to an Electron-based user interface, which is sure to prove less popular than the very nice libidvita slash gnome interface of bottles. I guess this is to allow support for macOS and Linux more easily, but fear not, there will be a second separate front-end using libidvita 
for people who prefer that. But the new interface will support the Steam Deck as well, and you will be able to share your bottles with friends, you will be able to back them up and restore them in one click, and you will be able to switch from the classic mode, the same kind of interface as you might use already, and the next mode which simplifies things a lot. Bottles Next will also support community installers, so it's easier for users to get something running. These will apparently be more complex to create than Lutris installers though. The app isn't available just yet, it's in early stages, and Bottles, the current app, will keep receiving updates and small features, but the focus will obviously be on the new improved app. And it's an exciting change, the addition of community installers and the removal of the barrier to entry that was learning about virtual C drives, prefixes and bottles for newcomers is actually really really good, so I can't wait to start using this thing and see how well it works. And let's finish this episode with the gaming news. First, the Steam Deck has now dropped from the top sellers list on Steam, at least from the top 10 list. After consistently being in there for more than a year and a half, it finally dropped to the 11th place. It's still pretty high, as that's a global ranking for all Steam sales. It's not super surprising to see that, as competition is now more intense in this space, and the deck is the exact same hardware as when it released, so there's bound to be some people opting to buy something else instead. And the deck might slowly reach saturation for its intended target as well. Wine 8.18 was released, with more improvements to the Direct Music API, more effect support for DirectX 10, but more importantly, more work being done to support Wayland and handle displaying and managing native Wayland windows, an important step to get rid of X Wayland and X11 as well for gaming. 44 bugs were also fixed, including for titles like Unreal Tournament 2004, Patrician 4, Sniper Elite 5 and a lot more. And finally, it's now official, Counter-Strike 2 will not come to macOS. As Valve said, they have made a conscious decision to first not support older hardware that only supported DirectX 9 or 32-bit, and also not to support macOS, as all these computers combined were less than 1% of all active CSGO players. CS2 being delivered as an update to CSGO, I guess it made no sense to keep supporting such a small platform. Which, if you think about it, is pretty fun, because Linux has a way smaller market share on the desktop than macOS, but for gaming, it's actually higher, and so Valve decided to port their game to Linux and not to macOS. But also, if you think about it, porting a game to macOS is a nightmare, you've got that game porting toolkit, but that's still decidedly a beta, and it's more intended to test your game than to give you tools to actually port it, and also, you have to use Metal as an API if you want to write a native game client, which kind of sucks because it's not a standard at all. What should be a standard, though, is the segue to our sponsor. If your computer is due for a replacement, stop looking at devices that ship with Windows pre-installed and crossing your fingers and hoping that your favorite Linux distro will run well on that hardware. Click the link in the description below instead and get yourself a computer that was made to run Linux. Tuxedo makes just that, laptops and desktops that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the hardware in these devices has been picked because it works really well with Linux. And if there were some quirks or some problems to iron out, they fix them and they submit patches upstream so everyone can benefit. They have a big range of devices that should cover every need and every price point from laptops, desktops, something for office work, something for gaming, they have it all. All the laptops can be opened, repaired and upgraded, including the SSD, the RAM, the battery and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer, click the link in the description below and get something that actually supports Linux in all senses of the word. So thanks everyone for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can always click that dislike button and tell me why in the comments. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to support it, there are plenty of links in the description of the video as well. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!